Hello. Uh, my name is Tim Berglund, and uh, this is my second time at DevOx Poland. I was here last year, and my third talk today. So anyway, I'm, I am delighted that you're with me. Thank you for coming. Who was, who was in the uh, talk I did just before lunch? Okay. All right. So you will see some slides in this talk that are the same. You have been warned. I warned you before. I've warned you now. Um, but they are different. They, they really are different talks. I, I, I think I have a different emphasis in this. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, if you weren't in that last talk and you're wondering what is this guy all about, uh, the previous talk is uh, I was filling in for a colleague who kind of at the last minute couldn't make it. So there's similar talks that are sort of designed to be done at different times. And anyway, just so you know, uh, so you know completely what to expect and you're not disappointed, that's always important to me. But let me tell you a little bit about me. Uh, my name's Tim. I live in Denver in the United States, and I work for Confluent. Confluent is a company that makes a streaming platform based on Apache Kafka, and I run the developer relations team at Confluent. So if you find a video tutorial online, probably we made that if it's a free one. Um, if you read documentation on the Confluent website or the Apache website on Kafka or the Confluent platform, uh, that's, that's my team did that, so that's either you can say thank you to us or you can blame us. You know, it's up to you. Uh, that's what we do. So our purpose is to make it easy and hopefully fun to do this stuff. Now, today uh, we are going to talk about microservices and microservices in the context of event-driven systems. And all of this is kind of going to revolve around Kafka in an unsurprising way. Uh, what I want to talk about, just basically to kind of lay out the outline for today, uh, I want to you know, just remind us, remind ourselves why we use microservices, what's good about that, and what the costs are, so the, the, the trade-offs that we make when we use microservices, how we, how we mitigate those trade-offs, how we solve those problems, and see where Kafka fits into all that. Now, all of this is going somewhere interesting. Um, and I won't spoil that surprise for you. We'll kind of get there at the end. But uh, with once, once you decide to go all in on microservices, and once you decide to integrate your microservices through Kafka, you end up doing architecturally a very, very interesting thing, and I think a good thing. And that's really uh, where we'll end up. And the room is small enough. If you have questions, just put your hand up. It's totally fine. Uh, that's how we do it back home. It's OK. I mean, like, don't interrupt me, but put your hand up, and we can just talk. That's totally cool. And if it's out of scope or it would just take too long, I'll just tell you, talk to me later, and we'll do that. So there you go. Now, um, why uh, or what, what, what's a monolith? Well, it's just a regular program. And the nice thing is that monoliths are easy to think about, right? Um, it's just one big piece of code, and uh, you know there it is. Except as monoliths grow, they're actually not uh, very easy to think about. When they get big, they become very hard to think about. Um, you get one large application, and it grows to a size that many teams need to be working on it. And the, the pieces of that application often don't align with the human team structures. And the way the teams that work on it communicate might not align with the way the application is structured. In other words, they don't help us manage complexity well. Venkat's talk, which is going to be the closing talk of the day. Oh, yeah, by the way, thanks for coming to the last actual session of the day with me. I, I appreciate that. Venkat's closing keynote is going to be about complexity. And I think we are coming to the conclusion that monoliths don't do a very good job uh, helping us manage complexity. They themselves are also hard to change, typically. Um, usually, now this, this is a little bit of a straw man, but uh, usually monoliths are hard to deploy, and I think the difficulty of changing them has to do with the difficulty of deploying them. Um, so, you know, they just, they generally, our experience has been as applications grow, they, they're harder to change, they're harder to deploy, they're harder to think about, and so we got this brilliant idea that we would take uh, the one big thing and break it up into lots of little pieces or microservices. 
The idea being each service is an application that's small enough to fit into your head. Each service is easy to think about. It's easy to change. There's not too much to it. One team can easily handle the, the service or even a set of services. And this is a good thing. So I'm always a little like ashamed of myself when I use the M word because it is such an overhyped thing that it just, it just feels like I'm riding a hype wave by talking about microservices. But the reality is it's a thing that we're doing. It is, it is a real architectural megatrend and it's really valuable. I don't think that it's bad at all. Um, the problem is to access the benefits of microservices, we have to do some fairly radical rethinking of application architectures. Suddenly, all of us become distributed systems developers. And if there's anything that you absolutely don't want to be, it's a distributed systems developer, right? What a terrible lifestyle. I mean, what if you could just write something that just ran on one server and like you wrote stuff to disk? You had like things in memory and you went home at three o'clock and you didn't think about work anymore. That'd be great. None of us do that. Uh, we're all all of a sudden distributed systems developers. So what really goes wrong? Well, remember in a monolith, it's, it's not like monoliths are unstructured, right? It's not like you're some monster who is terrible at writing code and you want things to be awful. Large programs have modules to them. They have structure. We try to do well. And when you have one module that needs to integrate with another module, it needs to pass data to that module and invoke functionality in that module. How do you do that in a monolith? It's a method call, right? There are literally microprocessor instructions to optimize that process. It's not expensive at all. Uh, you use the stack, you push stuff on the stack, you, you jump to a new instruction pointer value and the code executes, right? That's, that's, a, that's a cheap thing to do. The problem, once we, once we take our program and break it up into pieces and run them on independent computers connected over the network, the problem is reintegrating those pieces. What used to be a method call and a little bit of stack manipulation and, and a branch instruction is now a network call. It's now thousands, tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of times slower. Maybe millions of times slower. What a terrible idea, right? Uh, obviously, microservices have to be very good in order to motivate us to do this. So reintegrating microservices, once you break a module up into separate programs and run them on separate computers, um, there is, as I like to say, there, there are no good ways to integrate microservices. Uh, or, by adding a hyphen, we can say there are no good ways to integrate microservices. Um, trust me in English, that's a really funny joke. Um, uh, it's, it maybe it, I don't know if it quite landed, but the hyphen, like no good, means like, anyway, uh, talk to me later. So let's, um, it's great. <laughs> I, could think, I could think of four ways to do this, right? You have these separate programs running on separate computers. How might they talk? Well, uh, I guess, you know, People integrate things through the file system. I haven't actually heard of anybody integrating microservices through the file system, really just including this for completeness. This is kind of a common enterprise integration transport, but ideally, none of you are doing this if you are a simulator. Um, the database. This is certainly the thing that people tried first because when you're refactoring from a monolith, you have a database and it has all your data in it, and it sure seems convenient for one service to access the data of another service. And Maybe I'm not going to ask for hands because this is a shameful thing. Maybe there are people in the room doing this still, right? So what goes wrong when you do this? What goes right? Number one, it's easy. There's a database there. That's, that's why it happens. You have one, you know how to use it. The problem is you lack the discipline to keep services from commingling. All right, the, the, the data and what the domain-driven design people call the bounded context of one service always leaks into other services when you're integrating through the database. Um, what you really end up with when you're integrating services through the database, database is a very inconvenient to deploy monolith. Typically what happens is to version one service, you probably have to version many or all of the other services and also deploy them all when you, when you deploy a change to one. That's a common thing that emerges. So you, ha you have a monolith whose deployment process is terrible. In other words, all of the downsides of microservices and none of the advantages because you, uh, 
you pick the easy way out. Now, databases are not somehow bad. They didn't become bad. Uh, as we'll see, they're 100% appropriate to use inside a service boundary, right? So if there's a service and it has some, some rich data access things that it needs to do, uh, it's totally fine for that service to completely own, say, a little relational database or even a big relational database. Uh, and I'll paint a more detailed picture of that as the talk proceeds. But I'm not trying to banish databases. This is not trash talk. This is just saying that they are not for uh, negotiating change between services or sharing data or sharing events or anything like that. That's, that's, uh, it's, it's pretty well established at this point that you fail at microservices by integrating through the database. So please don't. Now, REST, or we might say more generally, I suppose, RPC, uh, pretty much at this point, everybody is, is uh, still using REST for this. What happens here? Well, uh, this avoids the problems of database integration because now all of the data that I need to, to go from one service to another, I have a copy of it. It's not some shared mutable thing lying around somewhere, but I say, here is all my stuff. I'm going to serialize it and pass it to you. You get the event indication and you get the data. And so that's a good thing. That, that solves some problems. Also, given what I'll call imperative programming sensibilities, this feels very natural. It feels like a function call. And in, in typical imperative code, uh, I'll do this kind of thing. I'll say step, 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 you know, function call, get result. And this just goes with the flow there. I don't have to do much rethinking of the way I write code. Now, an RPC call across the network is going to be a very slow method call, but that's fine. I can't feel a thing. It just looks like a method call because my API wraps it nicely, and it, it, it just goes with the flow. Also, if you are dealing with a request response kind of thing, like a web application where somebody submits a form um, or posts to an endpoint and they expect some blob of JSON to come back or a whole rendered HTML page, um, that request response paradigm, again, we're going with the flow of that. So this RPC-based service integration feels right, right? There's, there's very little rethinking that I have to do here. So what goes wrong? And by the way, um, I don't want to straw man this either. People succeed through RPC-based microservices integration. How do I know? Because I've talked to them. And there are, there are systems that work this way. It's a little tricky because you can get cascading failures. If you're making synchronous network calls to get work done and some service down the line fails, uh, like I don't know when I call a service how many other services it needs to call and I have a certain brittleness now because there could be some you know, call stack effectively happening there of, of greater than one, depth greater than one, and any service down the line that breaks is gonna call, cause all these guys to break as well. So I have this cascading failure problem, and there are ways to mitigate that, but you, know, you have to mitigate that. Here's the thing though. With a system like this, I still have to debug the system. I've got all these services, they're calling each other, they're operating asynchronously, my life is great, people are deploying them and versioning them without each other even knowing. It's, it's, it's like living in a Star Trek episode. And I still have to debug it occasionally though. It's not perfect, I, I have to know what's going on. And how would you debug a system like this? What is it that you do? Well, you build a log. You have to build a log, uh, a central log, and carry some kind of request context across and you know, group messages together so you can create a shared narrative of a particular business request or business operation. To which I say, thinking face emoji, uh, that's suspicious that a log emerges. When I picked something that wasn't a log to get all my services talking, I ended up having to build a log anyway to be able to understand how the service works or how the system works. Well, okay, so we got file system, not really credible. Database, please don't do it. RPC, okay, maybe. Now let's talk about events. I mean, you always put the thing that you want last. So here's, here's probably the good answer. And look at that. The question mark changed to a period, so clearly I mean this. Uh, let's just step back and define what an event is. An event, uh, I'll use this one-liner here, is a shared narrative describing the evolution of the business over time. It's a, th it's a thing that happens that combines the, the happening-ness, 
the notification of a point in time uh, thing happening with also the state about that thing. So there's state transfer and there's notification. Both of those things are entailed in an event. Also important, and this is kind of just a life fact anyway, events are immutable, right? You get angry, you say those words, you can't take the words back. You've said them. The event is immutable. It's there, locked in time. Nothing you can do except maybe create a compensating action. You can say new words, right? You can create a new event, but you can't undo that thing you did. Uh, and that's true of any of the events that we process in software as well. Uh, these properties, the combination of state transfer and notification and immutability, combine to make a pretty compelling solution to the microservices integration problem. Uh, and there are there's certainly more than one system for managing those events, for building your microservices estate on top of. I'm going to talk about Kafka because that's what I do. And I actually think Kafka is uh, probably all told the best way to do this for a variety of reasons. Because really Kafka is not just uh, that log. It's not just that event log. It is at its core the most basic inner part of Kafka, the, the most primordial part of Kafka that it was before it was anything else is an event log. And if you need to describe Kafka in a single sentence, you could call it a distributed event log. But it's more than that. It's a platform also. And once you get started using a, a system like this, there are these other things that you're going to need. And either you'll get them because they're in the platform and someone has, a community has developed them for you, or you will develop a buggy partial version of them because you don't have enough time to build the full thing, but you need something, and we don't want that. So uh, kind of for community reasons and for platform reasons, it's probably the right way to go. Now, let me just fill in the pieces here with, uh, uh, you know, give you a little description of what these things are. Let's start with the innermost component, the log itself. So uh, that log really is a log, right? When you put a message into it, you write it to the end, it is immutable, you don't change the messages that you've written before, um, and these messages hang around in Kafka. Kafka will store these forever if you want it to. It's configurable how long data lives in Kafka. It's interesting, there was, um, I, always, I always talk about the Confluent blog a lot because uh, that's, my team publishes the blog, so I, I see those posts far too much, let me tell you. I see a lot of blog posts. Um, it's painful. But there was a blog post about a year ago. It was like, I think it was like late last June about storing data in Kafka. It was written by the CEO. It was something like, it's okay to store data in Kafka. You know, there's a, there's a, there's a gauntlet thrown down for you. And uh, it made it like to the front page of Hacker News. Oddly, it didn't really seem like super trolly, front pagey kind of Hacker News material, but it made it there, and there was all this discussion. And normally, just as sort of a policy in my life, I try not to read the comments on Hacker News because, I don't know, I mean, you get to a certain age where you become aware that you're going to die someday, and you, know, you don't want the days that you have left to be spent in a certain way. So I don't read a lot of comments on Hacker News. But my boss slacked me, it was like eight o'clock at night, and she does that, she doesn't care. Um, and she said, hey, there's an interesting discussion going on on Hacker News about this data storage and Kafka thing. Could you, could you get in there? And I got in there. It was really interesting. Uh, the, the discussion was basically, well, you can't store data in Kafka. It's a queue. And a few of us were saying, well, you can configure how long Kafka retains the data, and the maximum is forever, and it won't ever expire the data. And so, you know, that would seem to indicate that, yes, you, you can. And it, it's replicated. It's, you know, these are files on disk, and they're replicated to other brokers and all this stuff. And I, the, the, the way the discussion proceeded was really weird because it was like a political discussion. It, it followed kind of the same template where everybody had a settled opinion, and they were talking, but they weren't really negotiating their opinion. It was like, well, I'm, I'm, I believe this, and I'm not going to believe otherwise. It's really strange for a thing like this. Like, no, seriously, here's the setting, and here's the config file, and here's the value you set it to. And they would say things like, well, what if you set it wrong? 
well, uh, yeah, you got me there. <laughs> so anyway, all that to say, uh, data is persistent in Kafka. You can make it, make it last as long as you want, to, want it to last. Seven days is the default, but it can be a long time. Uh, so these logs are persistent on disk. And the act of reading uh, a message from a log does not make it go away, which means now we can have multiple readers. So I can have this record of events, and if you're thinking ahead a little bit, this, these events are going to be things produced by a microservice. Like, you know, the orders microservice becomes aware that there's an order, and it validates the order, and it produces an event called validated order. Well, gee whiz, what do I want to do with that? Probably a lot of things. I mean, maybe I want to do fraud detection. Maybe I want to do, um, you know, uh, elite customer analysis and figure out who to send gift cards to. And maybe I want to ship orders. <laughs> that might be a good thing to do with an order, right? These are all things I might want to do. But if these are written uh, immutably in this log, I can have these multiple consumers cruising through it at whatever point they want to. So consuming a message doesn't make it go away. The bummer, of course, being this is a log, and the one way I get to access it is go to an offset. So effectively, I have one index. That's, that's the offset number. Okay, two indexes. Offset number and timestamp. But, like, you know, maybe there's a username field inside my message. Can I build an index on that? I cannot. All right, I can jump to a message, and then I can go forward. And those are both constant time operations. It's super fast to seek to a message. It's super fast to read the next message. And it's, it's, it's constant time. It doesn't depend on how many things are in the, the log. But this is the access pattern I have. And that is going to be limiting. So we'll have, to, we'll have to work around that limit in a little bit. So there's this log. And actually, there's logs. There's lots and lots of logs. So data is organized into topics, just like any messaging system. So when I produce a message, one of those producer applications there, uh, writes a message into Kafka, it has to identify the topic it's producing to. That topic is itself partitioned into many individual logs, and those logs can be distributed among the brokers in the system. So I could have you know, 100 nodes in my cluster, 100 brokers, and maybe a topic has 50 partitions, and each one of those partitions is on a different broker. And of course, replicated to at least two others. Uh, you know, we're not going to store it in one place. But point being, a topic is many logs, and that stuff is spread out all over the place. Many producers can be writing into a single log, a single topic. That's fine. Um, and many consumers can share the work of reading from a single partition. And the way consumers cooperate with the cluster to balance that work is actually pretty interesting. Kafka will try to automatically assign the partitions of a topic evenly to the consumers that are identified as a group. So if all four of these are your application, your one consumer application, then they're effectively running as a horizontally scaled application. And that you just, that's for free out of the box. All right, what else happens here? Um, what we just talked about the log, the producer, and the consumer. But we've got these connectors. So here's a thing that would happen. If you just took Kafka and ran with it and built stuff, you'd realize, hey, I've got this legacy relational database I need to read from. That's fine. Uh, I'll just use JDBC, and here's this select. And OK, uh, here's the current, ID, the last ID I've seen. I'll keep track of that. And every 100 milliseconds, I'll do that select again. And if I see a bigger ID, then I'll I'll get those back in the result set, and I'll produce them as messages into a topic, right? That'd be like the trivial uh, database reader. Now, if you think about it, you probably think there's at least two layers of complexity on top of that. That's going to get nasty after that. But you could build that. You could write that code. You're smart people. It would not take you long. Um, but then you realize, oh, wait, I need to scale that, and I need to keep, I need to remember the offset somewhere. And like, what happens if my process dies, and it comes back up, and... What about deleted records? And this, this afternoon worth of work would turn into a month or two of, of framework code that you hope nobody notices that you're writing. Uh, well, that's what Kafka Connect is. Kafka Connect is a built-in part of Apache Kafka that runs as a Kafka client. So this is a separate process that runs outside the brokers, acting as a producer or a consumer, in order to ingest from external data sources 
or output to external data sources. And it's not just databases. It could be files. It can be S3. It can be, uh, it could be Cassandra. It could be HDFS. It could be any of these things. So if you need a pluggable, declarative way of integrating Kafka with some other data source, you've got that. And this is an example of, if you ever think, why Kafka and why not you know, some other messaging system. This is an example of, of one of the platform components that you either get with the platform or you'll make it because it's got to be there. If you use this in any kind of real environment, it's a thing you're going to need. Um, and it's a thing that, that you know, Kafka, the community, has realized you need and it has built it. All right, finally, uh, we, what do you got? We got the log. We got producer, consumer, we got connectors. Let's talk briefly about a streaming engine um, just in terms of our real quick Kafka overview here. Once you have data in topics, you can write consumers that get messages back and imperatively process them, and that's totally cool. But again, there's stuff that you're going to build. You're going to realize I have to group by key and average, and I have to join one stream with another, and like all these things are going to come up. So um, if you're in the talk this morning, I talked about KSQL, which is a SQL-like language that I can use to just write something like that that's going to uh, do simple fraud detection. It'll, it'll group by a key and filter by a count and, and, and sports windowing and all kinds of stuff like that. It's all just kind of baked in. It's another part of the platform that you get for free. There's also a Java API that does the same stuff. This is Kafka Streams. Um, and this is really to get a good feel for Kafka Streams is its own 45-minute sort of talk. But you can see it's a Java API where I say, hey, here's a topic out here called Caterpillars, and I'm going to uh, tell the Streams API I, I want that to be a stream. Then I'm going to uh, map each message with some transformation and then output them to a new topic. Like I can just do that. Uh, in Java, and there's a whole bunch more of that API. It is rich to the point of being daunting for newcomers. It's, it's, there's a lot to it, uh, but it's a great API. All right, so that's Kafka. It's not just a messaging system. It's a platform. It's got things like the Streams API. It's got Connect. It's got KSQL. All this stuff that, again, if, if you didn't have it, you'd have to build it. Uh, if somebody didn't give it to you, you'd have to make it. But let's get back to our microservices and see where we can go with this. So we have our streaming platform. We have this rather, rather complete platform. Let's think about what would happen if we were trying to build, trying to refactor our monolith to microservices on top of this. So uh, we have these services, this very, very trivial e-commerce kind of thing. We've got orders and returns and payment and fulfillment and stock. Um, the problem is that even though we don't want to use a shared database, we have to grapple with the fact that these services most definitely need to share data, okay? Like, uh, maybe you, you have a stock service that would seem to own the catalog data, but of course orders needs to know about that. And, you know, that would suggest that orders needs to make a synchronous call out to the stock service to, to get something back, uh, and that's going to affect the latency of the order service. And orders kind of need to know who customers are, and, you know, shipment needs to know about catalog and customers, and everybody kind of needs a little bit of everybody else's stuff. That whole idea of taking our application and breaking it up into these little services doesn't get us out of the fact that those services need to know each other's state. Kafka is going to work as a messaging backbone, or sometimes I say a messaging substrate, that all of our services hang off of. The architecture diagram will look something like that by the time we're done. And finally, I want to I bring back to your memory, I said something before about events having two aspects. They are notification and they are state transfer. They are both things. So let's walk through an example. Let's buy an iPad. Now this is my RPC-based microservices integration. I have a web server that sends some, some kind of order request. Maybe it's a piece of JSON. Maybe it's an actual form request, whatever it is. Um, and the order service gets that. So order service has some sort of HTTP, uh, uh, is, is listening on some port, 
probably 80 or 443, uh, for this thing, becomes aware of that, validates the order, and then needs to ship it. So the REST version just makes that synchronous call, and the shipping service gets it. Well, fine, you know, the shipping service has it. It needs customer data, which is owned by the customer service, so it makes its synchronous call, and so on. LEDs are still very warm. It occurs to me I'm like standing up, getting very sweaty next to this thing. So it's not, uh, we think they're so low power, and they are, but that's a pretty good space heater. Okay, uh, let's start breaking this apart a little bit. Now, I, I break that synchronous connection between orders and shipping, and now the order service says, you know what, I'm going to validate that order and produce a message to a topic called validated orders. And now there's a message in that topic. The shipping service is waiting around for something to do. What is it, when does it know there's something to do? When there's a new validated order. So it's subscribed to the validated orders topic. And when that message shows up, it has an event. So now these guys are loosely coupled. If shipping service is down, that's certainly going to have an impact on our customers. But order service doesn't care. It's just producing new validated orders. There's no impact, no runtime impact to order service at all. Certainly business impact. It's not like downtime doesn't matter. But we have a little bit more freedom. So let's break the last connection and see what happens. This actually is a little harder here. Uh, when I break the rest call between shipping and customer service, we have to grapple with the fact that customer data needs to be here. And what we do there is we say, all right, fine, customer service, you, you own the customer data, but when the customer data changes, what you do is you produce a message into a customer data topic. That's like a change log of all the changes to all the customer records. Shipping service is materializing like a, an internal tabular view of that. It's like it's making a little private customer database inside this bounded context. Why is that okay? Because the source of truth is a change log down here. That, that topic in Kafka, which is durable forever, that's the new source of truth. Not some database owned here, not some database owned here. There's a topic here. How many other services need that data? Customer service doesn't know and doesn't care. It just has to make sure the change log is properly produced and anybody who wants can consume it and make their own internal customer table out of it. And you could do that with the Kafka Streams API, the Java API. You can do that with the database of your choice, right? You could have a little process that just consumes a thread that consumes from that change log and inserts those change log entries into, um, you know, a SQLite or a MySQL or a Postgres or whatever. Uh, we don't need to know. The people building that service get to choose that. They need to look stuff up. They have a change log. It's up to them. So uh, same with orders. You know, the, the sender fundamentally doesn't know who's going to consume the events that they send. So we have a truly decoupled system. The services do work based on whatever outside input they are excited by, and they emit their output, they produce their output into a topic. Whoever wants to consume that topic may consume it. Analytics, like I said, customer MVP programs, shipping, you know, little things like actually fulfilling orders, that seems like a good idea. Uh, stock services might want to be aware of that. Maybe stock services are aware of, of shipment events or picking events. There's some picking service that we need to build that we haven't even thought about yet. This ecosystem of services is now sort of able to grow. All right, let's do one, one more and uh, talk about a few other parts of the platform that we can do. So, uh, same kind of idea here. We have an order service, and uh, it becomes aware of orders through whatever mechanism. That doesn't matter. It validates those orders and um, produces validated, uh, validated orders to this topic. Now... Um, We have oh, another thing I didn't even mention before, the schema registry, which is another part of the, the, the broader Confluent Kafka platform. It's an open source thing. This can help us because you might be thinking, hey, these guys kind of probably have pretty interesting schema in them, and what are we going to do when you know, the format of an order evolves? That's another thing that a lot of companies, before there was a schema registry, bigger Kafka users built their own. Uh, Yelp is a good example of that. They were... They were 
early and sophisticated Kafka adopters. And if you look at their stack, they've built a few things that are now standard parts of the open source platform because they just, they just got there first, you know, before the rest of the community did. So anyway, um, schema registry is another little component that you might want down there that we're not going into in a whole bunch of detail that will help you uh, evolve the schemas of the things you've got in these topics. So that's always a problem. Now, imagine there is, uh, this is kind of the new system. We're refactoring our monolith. We're building these services. We feel good. We're using Kafka, just like Tim said we should. And uh, we feel good about ourselves. But this is uh, the legacy inventory database, and we don't get to just change that, right? That's, that's a part of the existing infrastructure. Many other applications rely on it, and it is well and truly a legacy system. You don't get to just go burn it down. That's not how it works. Uh, it's, it's out there, and it's going to stay. Well, uh, you would like stock to be in a topic, so you can use Kafka Connect as long as you can read the darn thing. Uh, you can use Kafka Connect to produce those stock changes into a stock topic. So now I have an immutable change log that is reflecting the contents and the evolution, the changes, of the stock database. So if the orders service needs to validate based on stock, and I've got this in a topic, well, remember, that means I can materialize that view of the stock database within the context of my orders service. How big is stock? What kind of database is that? Is it an in-memory SQL Lite? Is it a big giant Postgres instance? Is it a Cassandra cluster because things have just gotten totally out of hand? All of those are fine, right? Whatever the, I mean, it could use Mongo, you know, anything is fine in there. Whatever the persistence mechanism is that I want to use, all I have to do is subscribe to these events and, fulfill, and fill that thing up and I'm good to go. Um, and I can do more things like the order service can uh, reserve stock um, based on uh, orders that haven't shipped yet. Maybe it's a partial order that can't ship. I want to set aside a few things. I can create that, create a new uh, topic of ordered stock, of reserved stocks that other services can materialize as they need to. And uh, yeah, here showing stock minus reserve stock, I could make uh, you know an internal database out of that that the order service could use. So the whole thing ends up looking something. Oh, question. Money. Um, I'm not. The question was, what are the costs in terms of latency and money? Money's hard to answer because it um, depends on infrastructure, you know, if you're running in the cloud and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, I have, I am, I am being a little cavalier in my, it's okay, make copies of things. You know, it's, it's okay to make copies of data, uh, which it is from a, a correctness standpoint because all these events are immutable. So I certainly can make copies of immutable data and not worry about whether they'll be correct, um, but it does cost money to move them, costs money to do computation on them, it costs money to store them, so those, those are all things to consider, and I, I, it always bugs me when people say, oh, disk is cheap, you know, because in the cloud, that's a cost. <laughs> so uh, usually a lot of us can we, can, we can calculate how much that stuff costs, so I don't have absolute numbers, obviously, that your mileage is going to vary there. Yes. Yes. So you. I understand the question. Um, the additional infrastructure that you have to maintain is probably one of two things. It's probably either an actual database, like a little sidecar kind of thing, an actual relational database with its own storage, more likely it is a Kafka Streams K table where the Kafka Streams API is really handling the infrastructure for you and materializing that table into an in-memory view on which you can do very low-cost key lookups. 
It's, it's, it's the key lookup's performance of a hash table. So um, most of the time, if, it's, if your lookup is a key lookup and you're writing in Java, you're going to want that to be a Kafka Streams K table. So uh, latency is much lower than it would have been for a REST call. And if it's a database, latency is uh, still probably lower than a REST call. That, your mileage is just going to vary there. I mean, usually on the other end of that REST call, there's a database lookup there too. So uh, it's, it's, uh, it's never going to be worse than that. Uh, if you're if you're eliminating the network hop, yes. So th that latency is an eventual consistency question, not a request latency question, because uh, the request is satisfied based on what's in the materialized view inside the service, um, and latency of you know the the small numbers of milliseconds it takes to get that updated in memory is. Uh, your, the, the eventualness of your consistency. Uh, all right, so kind of wrapping this up, uh, this is what we've made. We've made an order service, um, and there are these various other things that we built a fraud service out and order details to look stuff up later on, an inventory service. You know, this kind of ecosystem of things grows up, and they're all integrated through Kafka. Uh, we don't have to worry about bounded context leaking. We don't have to worry about uh, consistency problems because the, uh, or integrity problems because the, the events are immutable. Now, what have we built? Well, um, there's nothing like a picture of an onion and some plastic rosemary to help clarify this. I do think that's plastic rosemary and that bothers me. But that's stock art for you. So uh, I would like to just ask you what a database is. Uh, we've been talking on and off about databases. And let's just think, to make it easy, let's think about a relational database and kind of peel the onion on this thing. Okay? So the outer layer of the database is an API. And that API is SQL. You submit SQL queries to the database, and you get some kind of result set or count or something like that back. Um, we all get that. And that's the nice thing about SQL is all of us know it, and it's super useful and kind of works, which is why we've had this history of rebuilding data storage technologies and saying at first, ah, oh, we don't need the relational algebra, it's fine. And then about five years later, rebuilding the relational algebra on top of the new data storage technology. I mean, we're doing it with Kafka now, so it's fine. Um, SQL is a good thing, right? Peel that, peel that layer of the onion off, though. Peel it away. What do we have? We have a data model. We have tables. Right? Tables have schema. There are potentially interesting data types in there. There's secondary indexes that I can, I can build on fields or combinations of fields. There's constraints. There's all this cool stuff, right? Apart from the SQL API, that tabular data model is, is a good thing. It's very useful. It lets me access my data and make assertions about the types of my, the typing of my data in ways that satisfy my semantics and my runtime requirements. Good thing. Peel that away, and what do I have? Well, some kind of storage engine. Some kind of storage, some sort of update-in-place storage engine. It's going to store indexes on disk. It's going to let me uh, make changes to rows, insert rows, delete rows, and kind of manage storage on the disk, right? Uh, that, that storage engine is going to be there. At this point, we're getting to a level of abstraction that's interesting for your, if you're a DBA or if you just really want to go deep on your database, but it's, it's harder to use. It would be weird to use this directly, right? Peel this layer away, and what do you have? Yeah. You have a log. You have a log, and it doesn't even matter if it's a relational database. Pick, pick your kind of database and, and look through the right path. And the first thing that happens is mutations get written to a log. And then what do you do? Well, then you build up all the other stuff. You build up your tables and you maintain your indexes and you do all this other stuff so that some API that you've agreed on, which is SQL, can access the data in an interesting way that conforms to the semantics that you've defined and answers questions in, uh, you know, according to the SLA that you need. It, it runs fast and it, it makes sense. 
and it's got this API. It starts with a log, but then the log builds up all this other stuff. All of those other things, the tables, those are all just kind of materialized views of what's in the log. Right? That's really what a database is. And it is not a bad thing. Databases are incredibly good things. If all we had to work with was the log, life would be bad. So we need that stuff. So remember this. This is kind of where we ended up. What are these things, these services here, like fraud and inventory and order details and shipment and all those things? Those are really materialized views of the events in the underlying log that are built up to satisfy the semantics of the people asking the questions and, and be able to return results in ways that satisfy the SLAs that we've defined. It sounds like I just said that, right? In a sense, you are not really writing microservices. What you're really doing is you're building an inside-out database. Each service is kind of analogous to a table in a database. And Kafka and Kafka platform and these various open source confluent components I've been talking about, this whole thing is, is the commit log and the stuff, platform stuff around that commit log uh, that you're going to need. So you're not really writing microservices. You're building an inside-out database, and I think that is probably the right idea. That's probably the right way to build systems. You know, we start off with microservices being cool and seeming like a good idea and seeming to solve some problems. Then you're like, wait, actually, they create a lot of problems. And then you get this idea into your head and you think, no, this is actually quite elegant. You're building a big, giant database. Pretty neat. So thank you.